All right. It's my enormous pleasure to welcome to Bad Faith Podcast, Miko Pellet, who is an Israeli-American activist, author, uh, and the author specifically of The General Son, The Journey of an Israeli in Palestine and Injustice, The Story of the Holy Land Foundation 5. Welcome to Bad Faith. Great to be with you. Thank you. I thought that maybe we could start by talking a little bit about your own personal trajectory. Your biography is so compelling given where your politics have landed today. Is it right to say that your your father was a, an Israeli general and your grandfather was a signatory of the Israeli uh, in Declaration of Independence? Is that right? Yes, that's true. I, I had many. They, they, those are the two main, the biggest names. But I, I had other members of my family, extended family, who all held important positions in the Zionist movement before Israel was established, and then after the state was established. So you know, kind of were influential over the first few decades of the existence of the state of Israel. Uh, so yes, I come from I come from this very very um, strong establishment Zionist family uh, with strong. Patriotic Zionist roots, absolutely yes. So maybe tell us a little bit about how you got from there. I presume when you were raised and coming up, you were raised as a Zionist as well. Oh, of course, of course. I was proud to be a Zionist. I was proud of my family's heritage. I was proud to know that all these important people. Uh, we had a great uncle who was the president of the state of Israel. So we, you know, I was very, very proud. Being that, and of course, I was. I went. I went to you know. I went to school, and the kids around me were all children of people who are who had you know fathers and grandfathers and so on who are famously known and so on. Um, but let, let me tell you a little anecdote that kind of reflects what it was like growing up. You know, one of the kibbutzim, one of the settlements that was taken by the Palestinian fighters in Gaza, Kibbutz Berry, and it's about four kilometers from the Gaza Strip. And um, I had cousins there, and we used to go there a lot. We used to spend summers there. I used to go there as a kid, starting for as, as early as I can remember myself. And it was a fun place to go. It's a beautiful, you know, beautiful kibbutz and with a swimming pool and lawns. And it was like, it's heaven. It was really heaven. It was really wonderful. And um, I went all the way through high school. You know, I would go there for summers. I had friends there and so on. Never once. Not even once, not for a second, not for a fleeting moment, did the thought ever occur to us that four kilometers away or four and a half kilometers away is the Gaza Strip with millions of people, hundreds of thousands perhaps at the time, whose land we were sitting on, we were enjoying ourselves on, we were using the water that we were using, and that these people are imprisoned in the Gaza Strip. Because, you know, the Gaza Strip was established in the 1950s by Israel as a strip, as a, as a place to, you know, herd in all the Palestinian refugees from southern Palestine. Never once did it occur to us. Never once did we talk about it. Never once was it ever mentioned that, number one, this is the land that belongs to people over there. And number two, that the suffering that goes on there. So what, what were you told about both Nothing. your kind of status and rights to the land you were on and about eventually at some point somebody had to have mentioned oh yeah there's palestinians over there so what can you help us understand what it was like to grow up in that environment well first of all nobody said palestinians i don't think i heard mm. the name palestinians since i was late in high school hmm. because of my father's activities uh after he retired he became a champion of limited palestinian rights within the two-state solution and then later on he met with the Yasser Arafat and so on so he had that trajectory Hmm. But as a Zionist, still within the Zionist construct, a two-state solution. But, you know, we knew that there were Arabs. We call them the Arabs of Israel. That's hmm. what they're called. That's what they're known as. And uh, we knew that um, they came and attacked us in 1948, and their leaders told them to escape, and they escaped. And now it's ours because this was ours to begin with. You know, we came back after 2,000 years. Hmm. You know, the Jews, this whole term, oh, the Jews came back. You know, it's like... Who are these the Jews that came back and where did they come back from exactly, you know? But this was a narrative and this was this was the biblical story and history were taught hand in hand, side by side. So we didn't, nobody ever questioned the fact that the Bible is not a history book and that the history we're learning is based on fiction, which is the Bible, mostly fiction. Nobody ever questioned that. That was a narrative. We were right. They were wrong. And after, you know, in the early 70s, when my father parted ways from the establishment and began talking about Palestinian rights and 
the need to allow the Palestinians to establish a state, a tiny state within the two-state solution in the West Bank and so forth. People thought he was a traitor and, and by default that I was the son of a traitor. Mm. And so that was that was a narrative. But I mean, nobody in my environment ever doubted for one second the uh, the right of Israelis to of Israel to exist, the the, the righteousness of the Zionist uh, cause, and so on, or, or or that the Palestinians had any rights beyond maybe limited rights uh, to the within the two state solution construct. That was it, and that was really later on. That was like mid late seventies, eighties, and so on. I served in the army. I looked forward to serving in the army. Today, of mm. course, I regret it. But uh, I served in the army. I was looking for, like I said, I mean, it was something every Israeli kid starts thinking about when they're still very, very young. So that was the, that was the, and it wasn't until much later in life that I actually started looking deeply into this reality in which I was raised. And you know, the subtitle of the book, the book's right behind, right behind me, it's The General Son, but the subtitle is Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. So what, I began this journey as an Israeli in a country that I eventually realized was Palestine. Hmm. You know, I was living as an Israeli in this bubble, in this, what we know today is called apartheid, but in this sphere that um, that existed with all the privileges, with running water and beautiful streets and and safety and, I mean, everything that you could possibly want, living in a kind of liberal democracy, a quasi-liberal liberal democracy. Um and it turns out that I was living in Palestine in some kind of a, a, a you know a settler enclave. And then later on, when settlers began taking over the West Bank, we didn't see ourselves, and, and most Israelis who are not in the West Bank don't see themselves as settlers. They are the settlers over there. We are legitimate Israelis. And again, it wasn't until later on until I realized, wait a minute, we're actually all settlers. This entire country is occupied. It's all Palestine. It's all occupied, and all Israelis are settlers. There's no difference if you're in what part of the country you're settling in. You're sitting on Palestinian land. You're denying Palestinian rights, and you know, and then you realize that you're living in an apartheid state. I mean, I, was, uh, yeah. Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm just saying that was the trajectory. I don't want to derail myself the way that I sometimes do by going down a kind of um, philosophical rabbit hole here, but as I hear you talk about being raised to be Zionist and then to no longer be Zionist. I'm reflecting on a conversation I had recently with a Jewish American friend about what it means to be anti-Zionist. Does Is there a direct conflict between this um, statement that gets bandied about so often, Israel has a right to exist, Israel has a right to exist, the implication that if you disagree with that statement, then you are supporting a kind of mass genocide of Israelis or... Um, forced relocation or whatever the case may be, and this idea of being anti-Zionist. So I'm curious, how do you define Zionism and what is it, you know, I wonder how you wrestle with this, that particular statement, Israel, does Israel have a right to exist? Does it implicate the idea, you know, can it be the case that Israel in its current form doesn't have the right to exist? How, how, do, how do you wrestle with that? Well, Israel is a product of a, of a racist settler colonial ideology which is Zionism, mm. which is that all Jews have a right to Palestine at the expense of Palestinians. And that at the end of the day, Palestinians have three choices. And Israelis have been saying this openly, you know, for decades. Palestinians have three choices. They can remain as residents without rights, without political rights. They can fight and die, fight and be killed, which is what we're seeing now. Or they can leave. That's it. Those are their choices. And we as Jews, although there's a big difference between a Jew and a Zionist, but we can maybe get into that later if you want. We have a right. Now, that is a supremacist, racist ideology, without any doubt. And it's a settler colonial ideology, and it produced an apartheid state. Surprise, surprise. An ideology like that can only produce a, uh, an apartheid state, because if you want to build a state for Jewish people in a land, in a country that is an Arab country, in the heart of the Arab and Muslim world, that it has to be an apartheid state, or you have to engage in, in, in genocide and ethnic cleansing. As it happens, the state of Israel has been engaging in all three. Now, I have to, you know, when, when you're an Israeli and you and you re make the get to the re realizations that I did, which are the realizations that I did, which is that you have to reject Zionism or else you have, you know, you're morally bankrupt. 
uh, than you do. You know, there's a little soul searching that goes on. So how do you fit into all this? Yeah. And, um, and, and there's two answers to that. First of all, nobody's talking about killing or expelling anyone. The reality today in historic Palestine is that you have about six or six and a half million Israelis and about seven and a half million Palestinians. Historic Palestine, meaning the boundaries of the historic Palestine being the Jordan River to the east, the Mediterranean to the west, Syria and Lebanon in the north, and the Gulf of Aqaba in the south. So within these boundaries, there's a, there's a, there's a serious Palestinian majority already. And um, I have rights, Israelis have rights, and the Palestinians live under a very complex, bureaucratic, uh, you know, apartheid regime that is really, 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 uh, you know, a cub, like a web of laws and, and bureaucracies and so forth. So nobody's talking about killing anyone. Nobody's talking about expelling anyone. Israelis and Palestinians can live together in peace. Hmm. They can. But it is not possible under the apartheid state. In order for that to happen, the apartheid regime has to be dismantled. One person, one vote, free elections have to take place. One person, one vote. And a free democratic Palestine has to re replace the apartheid state. That is the recipe for success. There is no other recipe which will allow Israelis and Palestinians to end up living in peace within Palestine. Now, I say Israelis, not Jews. Palestine has very little connection to Jewish people, although maybe biblically and faith-wise, there's some connection. But, you know, most Jewish people have always, most of this history lived in other countries. And... Um, Israelis are this unique new creation. I mean, these Zionists immigrated, and there was a, you know, a lot of you know massive immigration to Palestine. Palestinians were expelled, and now you have you know a minority, but a serious large minority of Israeli Jews and a majority of Palestinians who live within those boundaries. Now, Israel is the apartheid regime. Israel is the apartheid state. So in South Africa, they named it apartheid, which is a very ugly name. It means the segregation, separation. The Zionists named it Israel. Hmm. It's biblical. How could you possibly go against Israel? How could you possibly go against something that's so biblical and wonderful and, you know, the people of Israel returning and that entire mythology? Mm -hmm. So when you say Israel has no right to exist, then, of course, they come up and say, how could you say this? You know, finally, the Jews have returned. Finally, you know, after the Holocaust and so on and so forth. Well, Israel does not have a right to exist because apartheid regimes cannot, should not have legitimacy. Israel is the apartheid state. Now, what we're talking about is transforming that into a free democratic Palestine. That's what this is all about. So I'm I'm glad you said that. We I want to acknowledge that in any other context outside of this this kind of independent media sphere. You well know that kind of a statement, especially made by someone who is not Israeli and not Jewish, is considered to be one of the most controversial things that you can say for a couple of reasons. One, I do think there's this weird thing that's happening where with a lot of the output, rhetorical output that's coming out of Israeli official, officials and boosters these days, increasingly it feels like every accusation is an admission. Like one, people cannot conceive of the idea that meaning that something doesn't exist in its current form is anything but genocide at the same time that there is an ethnic cleansing going on of people of people in the Gaza Strip. Um, there was the accusation about you know, um, human shields, and I've been recently learning more, largely through the reporting of Abby Martin, about the one documented instance of a human shield being an IDF soldier, uh, like a literal human shield, so like holding up a human being in front of um, gunfire or what have you. Um, there was the picture of the Israeli kids, the allegedly Israeli kids in cages that became, was revealed to be Palestinian kids in cages. So it does feel like partly because of anticipating what you would do in the enemy's shoes, you are projecting all of this stuff and then not hearing an argument that says, well, what if it means that, what if Israel doesn't have a right to exist? Does it mean you're genociding Israelis? It means that the current apartheid state that persists is not sustainable and is not ethical. And I do think there's an incredible amount of work that is being done by this phrase, Israel has a right to exist, that very few people in any kind of public space would dare to refute because of the implications of it, these kind of sort of genocidal implications of it. And so I really do think it's powerful to have people like yourself who are willing to, to, to challenge that 
baseline understanding that seems to be widely spread and to say exactly what it means for Israel to no longer exist. You know, I think they're talking about genocide as they are committing genocide. Yeah. As they're committing genocide, they talk about their own genocide. You know, Israel was established three years after the end of World War II. Uh, yeah, World War II. And, you know, the, the so, so some of the definitions of what it means, wh what are crimes against humanity, what is genocide, came, as a, came out as a result of what happened to the Jews in Europe, the Holocaust. Three years after that, Israel was allowed to be established, was permitted to be to, to be established, was recognized, and immediately began ethnic cleansing, establishing an apartheid state, and engaging in what I absolutely believe has been a genocide that began then. Now, it's a slow genocide, granted, but without any question. Because when you see the targeted massacre of Palestinians that started way back then, and goes on in full force till today. Of course, today, you know, Israel has got much bigger weapons, and so they can kill many more people at the same time, uh, you know, at, at one time. But there's no question that Israel has been targeting civilians, you know, in, in huge, in large numbers, on a regular basis, in the Gaza Strip particularly, because that is a particular problem, and I saw that Israel has, has no way to deal with. I mean, they can't. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 sensible thing, the moral thing, would be uh, to open the Gaza Strip and allow people to go back to their homes and their villages and their towns, you know, from where they were thrown out. But Israel doesn't want to do that. To let it sit, of course, you can't let it sit. People are going to ask questions. It's embarrassing. You've got millions of people sitting in a prison. So they decided to kill them and blame them for it. And they've been doing this since the Gaza Strip was established by Israel in the early 1950s. You know, there was never a strip. Gaza is a city. There are other cities around it. Why is there a Gaza Strip? How did that even happen? Well, here's somebody drew a line and said, well, we're going to push all these refugees from southern Palestine into a into an area that was flourishing, that was known for its beauty, known for its, you know, wonderful citrus fruit and for, mm -hmm. and for fishing and for, you know, Gaza was a city of great culture and wealth going back you know, thousands of years. Suddenly it became a, a synonymous with catastrophe, with, with, with humanitarian, uh, you know, uh, catastrophe, really, and so on. And so overnight, and Israel began attacking Gaza pretty much as soon as, as they established the Gaza Strip. And of course, today, like I said, they've got bigger weapons, so they're killing more people. But Israel, three years after the end of World War II and the end of the Holocaust, Israel was permitted to engage in three crimes against humanity. Immediately, and they've been going been going at it for 75 years. You know, Netanyahu said on October 7th, we are at war. Well, of course we're at war. You declared war on the Palestinians 75 years ago. Yeah. Specifically, but you know. So that so so unless you unless you take a, a look at, you know, put everything in context, you're dragged into a conversation that they want to have about a possible genocide and possible anti-Semitism and possible this, that, and the other, and all these rumors about. The Palestinians, and the reason people are buying into this is because of the racism that already exists against Arabs and Muslims and Palestinians. Well, of course, Arabs and Muslims are, are a mob, and they're capable of, you know, if they see a white woman, they'll rape her, and if they see white babies, they'll kill them. Because the racism is already is already is already you know programmed into people. So when they see this, Israelis believe this, Americans believe this, they believe the worst of people of color anyway. So it's a very easy target. Nobody stops to think, are you out of your minds? What are you talking about? Who was committing the genocide? Who was murdering babies? Who was burning babies when they dropped these one-ton bombs on buildings? And we should know that just before we started recording, uh, news broke that hundreds, that toll keeps going up. Uh, I saw initially a number that was something like 500, and then I saw another estimate more recently that said 1,000 uh, people were killed as a consequence of an Israeli airstrike on a Gaza City hospital. So killing not just the medical practitioners there and all of the patients, but a lot of people who have gone to shelter in hospitals believing that it was a safer place than staying in their home. And this is a this is an Episcopalian hospital. A Valley Hospital is not a government hospital. It's a private uh, Episcopalian Christian hospital. hospital. Yeah. It belongs to the to the to the um uh you know to the Episcopal Church. Yeah. So it 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 does seem it, it doesn't seem, it is particularly galling to have these accusations made about Palestinians 
when so much of one's own behavior or one's own government's behavior is reflected in those very accusations. I, I want to go back to the kind of personal narrative you were talking about. You were saying that your father in the 1970s started to wake up to some of the injustices that were going on with what, what was, I guess, described at the time as, or described within Israel as the Arab-Israeli population. Do you know what motivated his kind of political shift on that issue? Yes, and but he never thought started as a political shift because mm. he was, you know, he was one of the generals who, you know, planned and pushed for and and, and conducted the nineteen sixty seven war, and um, as soon as the war was over, the war actually was not a six day war; it was a five day war. They call it a six day war in reference to the six days of creation to make it sound like it was a miracle. But mm. the day of the war, the Israeli High Command had its first meeting. It's first, you know, after the war kind of uh, meeting, and they, uh, and you know, and but, and and you know, I read the minutes of the meetings, and so he stood up and he said, "Look, we now, you know, we're strong. We're here. We've established ourselves. Now is the time to make peace with the Palestinians." Um, and uh, people looked at him and said, "What are you out of your mind?" And he said, "No. Now we have an opportunity to make peace with our neighbors." I mean, there's another nation here that lives in this country. We have two choices. We either negotiate a two-state solution with them based on this new these new victories that we had. So now the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, as opposed to the partition and two-state solution plan that was you know was in existence you know 20 years before that, the partition plan, where we have a huge advantage now. It's 20 percent of our of 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 our country of, of the land of Israel, which he firmly believed was Israel, and Israel had a right to. Said, but we need to compromise so they can maintain the 80%, maintain our the accomplishments and the victories of 1948, maintain a Jewish democratic state, and have peace with our neighbors so we can move on. He, you know, he believed this thoroughly. He said, This is the best, this is the interest of the of the state of Israel. Yeah. And um, you know, he was taken aside by, by the general saying, you know, nobody wants to hear about this nonsense right now. And as he was saying these words, as this was going on, he, he retired from the military about a year after that. But, you know, Israel went full force in building settlements and destroying. I mean, at least half a million Palestinians were thrown out, were, were, were displaced after 1967. And massive settlements were being built uh, in the West Bank and, and, and in East Jerusalem immediately. In other words, it wasn't something that people said, well, let's think about this. Immediately, the settlements were built. Immediately, Palestinian towns and villages were destroyed. And like I said, about a half a million Palestinians were kicked out. After he retired, he dedicated his life, the rest of his life, to this idea of what is known today as a two-state solution. He was part of a small group of Israelis that used to hold high office and were dedicated to this cause. And then they began negotiating at first in secret with the Palestine, Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO. Eventually, they met with uh, Yasser Arafat, and you know they had very strong connections with this. And that was really the seed that led to people, you know, to Oslo, eventually, to what is, I believe was catastrophic, uh, catastrophic for the Palestinians. Um, but that was his, that was his kind of his second legacy. And he did a lot of work with Palestinian citizens of Israel, trying to help them out in their very complicated legal, legal um, situations when they were arrested or their land was confiscated and so forth. And so Palestinians of that generation have a great deal of, of respect for him. But it was all within the Zionist construct. It was all within, you know, this is our country, we have a right to remain. Palestinians will be given a small state and they need to say thank you and shut the hell up. Tell me then about your trajectory away from Zionism. As I understand it, you suffered a pretty significant personal tragedy in which your niece was killed by a terrorist, and yet your reaction is not the one that I think many people would anticipate. Hearing that a Palestinian was the was the result, a Palestinian had killed your your relative. Yeah, so this is the late 1990s, it was 1997, and the late 90s, mid to late 90s. Uh, by the way, Netanyahu was prime minister then as well, and there was a lot of violence. Buses were being blown up, people were being killed. It was terrible. And uh, in one of these in one of these attacks, uh, three young Palestinians blew themselves up in in Jerusalem, in downtown Jerusalem. And my niece was one of the people who were killed. She was mm. thirteen years old. Mm. My niece, Madame, my sister's little girl. I'm and so sorry. Uh, um, and you know, I've said this before. It's, it's tragic that the kind of thing that forces us as humans 
to make significant shifts in the way we view the world, in our belief system, it's usually as a result of a tragedy. It's usually something terrible. And this is precisely the kind of horrific event that really shakes us up and forces us to take a really close look. So, you know, we, people say, oh, suicide bomber, and they move on. I'm like, oh, wait a second. So three young men blew themselves up, killed themselves, and killed a whole bunch of innocent civilians with them, including a, f- a few girls. I mean, my niece was just, it was September. She was in, she, she, she went out with a few friends to buy school supplies, whatever, books. Mm. Um, we can't just say it like it's nothing and then move on and talk about something else. Let's, let's think about this for a second. Three young men go and kill themselves and kill other people. What the hell is going on here? Yeah. And... Um, her mother, my sister, was the first one to say, you know, when you treat people like this, that's what you get. What do you expect? Mm-hmm. You know, we kill their parents, we blow up their homes, we take their land and their water, we throw their brothers and sisters in jail, we shoot them in their own schools. Do we really expect that something like this was not going to happen? Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, I was, you know, I, I went, I, you know, I already lived in the U.S., so I went back there and I, you know, I was there for a while. And then when I came back, he used to start to. What do you do? You can't just go back to work the next day like nothing happened. And so I began looking and searching to, you know, for engagement. And I found a, uh, uh, this was around, by the time I I got into this and actually figured out what I wanted to do, it was the early 2000s. And I was living in San Diego. And at the time there were these, what they were called living living room dialogue groups. Jewish, Mm -hmm. Palestinian living room dialogue. People would meet once a month at somebody's home. And there was food, and everybody told their story. Told their story. It was dialogue. It was not a political debate. And I landed on one of the, in one of these groups in San Diego. The Palestinian community just really adopted me. Hmm. Now, everything they said, I rejected. Because they were talking about massacres. They were talking about ethnic cleansing. They were talking about horrible things that happened way back in 1948 when Israel was established. Well, my father fought in 1948. We were the few and the brave, and they were the many and the cruel. Mm. It's like they're telling me the night is day, the day is night. It didn't make any sense. But also what happened at that time was that several Israeli historians, the most notable of whom was Ilan Pape, came out with books. That they're called the New Historians, and they came out with new books, with new information about 1948. Mm. They validated everything Palestinians were saying. So I delved into these books, and I read them, and I met these guys, and I met Ilan Pape and others. And, and then I started traveling into Palestine myself and meeting Palestinians there, both Palestinian citizens of Israel. But still, I mean, their cities are fully Palestinian. I mean, you drive into one of these cities, you're suddenly in a different world. Mm. The, the billboards are in Arabic. Everybody speaks Arabic. Hardly anybody speaks Hebrew. I mean, it's, it's a whole different world. And I began driving myself into the West Bank, and I describe it. Uh, in the book, the first time I drove into the West Bank, I thought I was going to be my last day on Earth. And gradually, I allowed the trust to push out the fear. Because mm. the fear, I didn't realize I had fear. I realized I was afraid of Arabs. I was oh, you thought it was going to be your last day on Earth just I because thought, of being there, being in Palestine as, a, as an Israeli. Arabs were going to kill me. I'm alone in a car. Mm. Very identif- clearly an Israeli. Mm. And there's a bunch of Arabs here everywhere. Of course, they're going to kill me. What else were they going to do? Because mm. the racism is in so deep, it's injected into you at such a young age that it makes sense to you to believe the worst about the other. It makes sense to believe the worst about the other. And that's what we're seeing now with these with the Palestinian, the stories about the rumors about what the Palestinian fighters did. Yeah. They came out of Gaza. Because there, we're the racism is so deep that it makes sense to us. Like, well, of course they'll do this. They're Arabs. It's, it's necessary. I'm increasingly realizing it's necessary to the project of defending Israel as an apartheid state. Because right, you were alluding to this earlier. It's a demographic game at the end of the day. If you allow yeah. full civic participation, including voting rights, when you know that you're in an overwhelmingly Arab population, then you can no longer establish any kind of religious hierarchy or as explicitly Jewish state, et cetera. And so to to justify, to justify an unequal treatment, you have to, it, it's very helpful to have a generalized belief that Jews and Muslims, Arabs and Israelis cannot live peacefully next to each other. And you hear people say this just as a matter of course. 
it is they are like constitutionally unable to exist living side by side peacefully. And you, you can kind of start to understand the work that's doing, right? It, if it weren't true, if you could just fully integrate people into your society, if people believe that you could fully integrate into a diverse, pluralistic society, then why on earth would you need rules that treated one group differently than the other? Well, exactly. I mean, there wouldn't be any racism. <laughs> that's another point of race. I mean, European racism, really, the Zionism is this, you know, European racism and Southern colonialism. In, in the in a nutshell, that's really what it is. Except it applies to Palestine, and um, and it makes. I mean, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what it is. I mean, you couldn't have an apartheid state. You wouldn't have you know all this discrimination if you didn't firmly believe it. And you need to you need to educate people to become racists. I mean, you have to educate people to become racist. Nobody's born racist. You have to really invest in racist education in order to be able to do the kinds of things that Israel does or the United States does or other you know, other racist uh, states and other racist societies. Yeah. You have to invest in this. And it's a, so that when, so that then when you accuse somebody, uh, people of color of these horrific acts, people have no trouble believing it. People have no trouble believing it. And what is happening now, the rumor mill, and I'm getting into a lot of trouble by first saying this, I've been saying this from the very, from the very beginning, in trouble people, you know, for Israelis, including my family, that um, I'm saying, we don't know what happened that over the last week. I mean, we know that the attack was executed by these Palestinian fighters, was executed, you know, militarily brilliantly, tactically, strategically. It was, it was, it was flawless. And they caught Israel off guard and on and on. And we can talk about the ineptitude of, of the Israeli military and intelligence system. But all these rumors that have been thrown out there are just eaten up. Completely eaten up and accepted. Like, Repeated well, by the president of the United States of America and then retracted. And there's still people who are saying that it's true, the beheaded baby, 40 beheaded babies. Because once you put it out there, now you have to prove that it's not true. Instead of them having to prove that it is true, everybody else has to, Palestinians have to prove that that is not true. Palestinians yeah. have to denounce, well, for 75 years, Palestinians are being tortured in the worst possible way. An entire nation is being tortured in the worst possible way by Israel. And the world ignoring it completely. And I'm talking about, you know, everything from just being a Palestinian and having to worry about how you're going to be killed just because you're Palestinian and the way you look, to knowing if your home is going to be demolished, your father's going to die, or your mother's going to go to jail. I mean, just every single day, whether or not you're going to have water the next day. I mean, every aspect of life is torture for Palestinians. And then, of course, the bombings and the killings of your people. And Palestinians have to justify and excuse and explain and denounce something that may, may, we don't even know if it, happened, if it took place yet. And testimonies by Israelis are now saying that a great deal of the hostages that were killed so far in the crossfire were killed by Israeli troops. This one hostage that from that same kibbutz that I mentioned earlier, Be'eri, was saying that the Israeli shell, Israel shell, shell, you know, a tank shell blew up up at one of these houses full of Israelis in it. So we don't know the full extent of what happened yet, and it's going to be a while before that happens. But we know for sure what Israel is doing to Palestinians. Well, also immediately, speaking of the the hospital bombing, people have been very clip, quick to clip all of these commentators on mainstream news who immediately started covering it in a way they keep alluding to the fact that, well, the IDF is saying that it was a Hamas misfire. And they already have gotten several pundits on the mainstream channels to repeat this, what seems to be very unlikely, pushback. Um, uh, I, I think Anderson Cooper was one, and I definitely saw a separate um, commentator already saying this. And so Hamas it is really not that kind of firepower. Hamas does not have that kind of firepower. And it's incredible. And so there's no pushback from journalists whose entire job it is to question, not just not generally question the news, but especially question the talking points that are coming from the very institution that has an interest in you believing that the, the very bad thing that you're covering wasn't them. Yeah. You know, are they, are they normally covering murder scenes? And they say, well, the quote from the murderer is that they definitely didn't do it as they stand there with blood on their hands. It's yeah. it's incredible. And then so many people who watch it are going to come away with the idea that at very least there's some ambiguity around yeah. who is responsible. And that's really the game. And the other uh, the other accusation is that Hamas are hiding in the, you know, that Hamas, is, it, Hamas or the Palestinian fighters are somehow, you know, hiding among civilians and their bases are among civilians. And that's why. And so that everything's kind of just- Hamas's fault. 
let, let me ask you about this, Miko, because I've noticed, and I'm very interested in this. Obviously, 1,300 people being killed the way they are, 1,300 innocent civilians being killed is an unequivocal tragedy, right? Like it's, it, it, there's, there's no parsing the tragedy of the loss of human life. And there's been a lot of commentary around reactions from some left groups in the immediate wake of the last Saturday's events that were celebratory. Now, I would argue that some of them were celebrate, celebrating the idea of Palestinian liberation as opposed to the loss of life per se. Others, I think the line was more blurry. Um, but certainly the line in the sand that has been drawn in all public conversations of this is that it is very inappropriate to not condemn the actions of Hamas, a terrorist group, et cetera. And I've noticed that as you're talking about this, you're referring to them as fighters and choosing not to characterize them as they're characterized more generally speaking in the mainstream on both the left and the right. And I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit and what your thinking is there. Well, first of all, I don't, I, I reject the notion that Palestinians are engaged in terrorism at all. Terrorism is to terrorize people, you know, for the sake of terrorizing people, which is what Israel does. Mm. Israel terrorizes Palestinians for the sake of terrorizing them, to get rid of them, to kill them. Mm. The Palestinians' objective is liberation. The Palestinian objective is to create a reality where people who live within Palestine feel safe and free, and the children can go to school without worrying whether they're going to be killed, and parents can send their kids to school and then go to work and live a normal, healthy life. That's not terrorism. When your objective is something that will improve the lives of everyone, that's not terrorism. Yeah, I take that point, but that is, I think that argument, if extended, which I'm frankly sympathetic to, but that argument, if extended, of course, Incor incorporates a whole lot of groups, not only groups that I fundamentally don't think are ever terrorists in any way, like Black uh, Black Panthers or Black Lives Matter or the ANC, but also, you know, this the, in the in Ben uh, Osama bin Laden's statement after 9-11, which has been circulating around a lot uh, in the last week or so, he specifically cites injustice against Palestinians for part of what has motivated that attack and looking for equality for Arabs. And a number of groups, ISIS, whatever, of course, are all making similar arguments about wanting liberation for their people in various ways, shapes, and forms. And I'm I'm just trying to parse through how to talk about these things in a way that doesn't come off as though you are, that acknowledges the limitations of an oppressed people who have been stripped of nationality and the ability to raise an army and have a government and fight quote unquote official wars. The reality that guerrilla warfare is so often the last refuge of an oppressed people. Exactly. The historical reality of these groups that are now like celebrated in some instances, at least in like the black American context, having at the time or in South Africa at the time, very much being hated on by the press and characterized as terrorists and wanting to be on the right side of history and balancing that against not wanting to come off as indifferent to the loss of civilian life, the value of those civilian lives, and all of that. Do you know what I mean? That I think that is that is what the left, as it's been attacked for being insensitive, cruel, or as I was just recently described in the Daily Beast as, as symp sympathetic to terrorism. <laughs> you know, that that is the pressure, you know? The, 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 I mean, these claims are to be expected, but to, to your point, I, I mean, every everybody has a mother and a father and, and, and every death is tragic. That, that goes without saying. I, I don't think anybody needs to explain that. But if anybody needs to apologize for violence, it's not the Palestinians. The vast majority of Palestinian resistance over the last 75 years has been unarmed resistance. Palestinians hold the names of, of Martin Luther King Jr. And, and, and Gandhi in the highest regard. And the vast majority, and I have many activist friends and Palestinian activist friends, and they all hold these names to be, you know, God, like gods, you know, like a religion. Mm -hmm. Just civil disobedience and unarmed resistance is like a religion for Palestinians. And we see that. The vast and you've majority seen it, yeah, yeah. 
majority of Palestinians are sensitive to unarmed, but it's it's ridiculous to expect, ridiculous to expect that a nation that has been under so much suffered so much oppression and so much violence has been on the receiving end of so much savagery. And I mean savagery, the worst yeah. kind of brutality by an army that has endless resources, the Israeli army, endless resources, and the worst, most cruel uh, types of weapons, that that nation that's been on the receiving end of this will not stand up from time to time and engage in armed resistance is ludicrous. It's crazy. It's absurd. And then to demand from them to apologize and explain, well, if they listened, if Israelis cared, if the hundreds of thousands of Israelis that were in the streets over the last year or so protesting, said one word about Gaza, this could have been prevented. They are the ones who have the, the ability to prevent this violence. This could have been prevented by Israel. These lives that were killed, yeah, the lives that were killed, that were taken, and we don't know exactly, I don't think we know the numbers exactly, but whatever they were, it doesn't matter if it's one or it's a thousand, it's, it's a tragedy. But this was done not by Palestinians, by, it was by, by Israel. The problem is that for Palestinians to get attention, this is what they need to do. You know, and, and even Israeli generals have been admiring the ability of the Palestinians to completely paralyze Israel for a week. Israel has been paralyzed. So I want to talk, I want to get into the details. I think a lot of this reporting, for obvious reasons, there's a lot to cover, but it hasn't really squared in on what happened that day on the ground, how um, Hamas was as successful as it was. Um, and that, but just before we get off this, I do think when you when you allude to um, how, how uh Palestinians hold some of these um, kind of pacifist, nonviolent figures in such high regard. It really needs to be noted, especially the um, the March of Return back in 2018. That specific example, like yeah. I, I am, I am not a pacifist, but I do think that violence has to be a, a last resort. And it only the only way that you could think that this wasn't from the perspective of Hamas or any other. A group that might be sympathetic in Palestine is if you were completely ignorant of all of the efforts Palestinians have made to make themselves heard, including thousands of people participating in this great march of return. And as a consequence, 150 odd Palestinians were killed, shot at, sniped at by IDF soldiers. Um, hundreds more had had, to, had their legs amputated because they were being shot at in the knees and the legs and the ankles. Um, so that they they have been met with violence at every turn in their efforts of nonviolence, and that that shouldn't go unremarked upon. But let's let's get to the nitty gritty because I I am I am really curious about the conditions that allowed Israel, which really does present itself to the world, and I think not wrongly, as a supremely um, able army, um, technologically superior in all of these ways. Obviously, mandatory conscription and every every citizen is basically trained in some way as a, as a as a condition of being a citizen to have been overcome in this way by people with no resources little to no resources at all what happened on saturday well i think we saw once again that this 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 theory about israel being this incredible army and having these remarkable intelligence abilities was a myth it was not true and i've been saying this for a very long time we have seen historically every single time this great military and this great you know, uh, intelligence apparatus was challenged, they were defeated. Every time they were challenged, they were defeated. We saw it 50 years ago in the 1973 October War when Israel was surprised and practically almost defeated. It wasn't as bad as this, uh, although these were two massive armies that surprised Israel. We saw this in 2006 when Israel tried to, uh, was, was engaged, Israeli military engaged with, with uh, Lebanese Hezbollah fighters in the north, and they all, and these were Israel's elite forces went to fight them and had to run back home with their tails between their legs. And we saw now, and like you said, these Palestinian fighters came out of one of the poorest places on earth with zero resources. Not only zero resources, there's no space. Where I mean, this required months and months of planning and training. This was an incredibly, regardless if you like it, you're for it, you're against it. Nobody can deny. Even like I said, Israeli generals were like saying, "What a remarkably successful and well planned, well executed military operation this was." Mm. And by people that, where did they train? They don't have three meals a day. Israeli soldiers, you know, have all the food they want, all the ammunition they want, everything they want, and they fail every time because they're inferior to the Palestinian. 
to the Palestinian fighters, to Arab fighters. Every single time the Israeli military faces a well-trained, well-equipped, and you know, well-led military force, they get wiped out. And what we saw now is we saw again this handful of Palestinians coming in from the air on gliders. It takes a long time for them to cross that border. How do you even where do you even get where do you even get a glider? Like, did they just make them together out of scrap metal and sheets? Like, what what was even do we, what do we know about that? We don't know. We don't know. We can only guess. We don't know. We can only guess. And then they came in on uh, by land. They just they just because the, in many places the fence was just a barbed wire. Mm-hmm. So they came by land and they came by boats too, by small boats, by small, you know, vessels. And, uh, and you know, the army was not there. The, the, I mean, they took over 22 settlements, 22 Israeli towns and villages and kibbutzim, they took over. And it took days before Israel could even, you know, could even get, get a grasp, grasp on what the hell was going on. They could not get, and I was talking to people, uh, you know, to, to, to Israeli to family members and, and friends, and there was no direction. The army was nowhere to be seen. The police was nowhere to be seen. The battles were going on. The Palestinian fighters were going in and out of the Gaza Strip over, over you know, just crossing the, the, I think the fence was only closed like yesterday for the, finally, after about mm. a week. And the country was paralyzed. There was no direction from the government. There was nobody speaking. There was no information available. Nobody knew what was going on. The forces had to be brought from other places. The reservists, which normally... You know, to get reservists in, to get them equipped, to get them ready, to send them to the where the fighting t- it takes 24, 48 hours. There was no logistics, there was no equipment. It was a mess. Mm-hmm. But that is not that is not unprecedented. This has happened before. And it's because there's no there's a myth. There's this other narrative that I've heard a lot from Zionists that says Palestinians are complaining now. They're just mad because Arabs lost all of the wars. Uh, there were these uh, two state deals on the table, but uh, Arab countries got greedy. They tried to fight with Israel and they lost. And now they're expecting to get land, even though they just lost lost the war. So what are they referring to when they say things like that? I have no idea. I have no idea what they're referring to because none of this is true. None of that happened. So what they, they, it's up to them to, just, to, to, to explain what the hell they're talking about because none of that ever happened. None of that ever happened. Israel came in in 1948 and committed a massive campaign of ethnic cleansing and genocide, established an apartheid state. In 1956, Israel, um, along with, with Britain and France, attacked Egypt. Again, there was a war. 1967, Israel engaged in a brutal, a brutal campaign against its neighbors to grab more and more land, and they did, and basically finished the job of, of, of occupying you know, historic Palestine by taking the. But is that is that what they're pointing to? Is Israel's success in grabbing that land what they're pointing to to say Israel has a good, uh, as obviously a successful army? The Zionists have completely rewritten history, and the good thing is, and when people believe that history, it's only a sign of ignorance. Really, when people repeat the Zionist history, it's a sign of ignorance. The history is well known; it's recorded everywhere. It's written. I mean, in my book, I quote from the Israeli military archives minutes of the meetings of the generals. The 1967 war was not a war of defense. It was not a war of, of, you know, necessity. It was an opportunity, and they talk about it. We have an opportunity. Let's do this. Let's get out mm-hmm. there. And then, you know, in five days, they managed to they, they managed to conquer all of these lands and, and 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 defeat, you know, entire Arab armies. You know what I mean? So the the, the myth that somehow Israel is this poor little thing that miraculously managed to manages to defeat these mean Arab armies, and then you know, spoils of war. It's ours. It's complete nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. And you know, one other myth I just want to touch on Please. On, a previous, on a previous topic, there's another myth story out there that sadly was now was now given legitimacy by Seymour Hersh, that the only reason the Palestinian fighters were able to come from Gaza was because the Israelis wanted to let them do it, that they knew about the attack and they let them do it. In other yeah, words, I was going to ask you about that. that. You know, and the only way the Palestinians can succeed is if Israel is in control and allows them to succeed. You know what I'm saying? Israel is always in control here. If something happens, it's because Israel allowed it. Israel is this, you know, this overpowering. But, but what about this argument? Because the other side of it isn't that it's like a kind of a backhanded compliment of Israel's ability, but that it is part and parcel of this broader narrative that says uh, Benjamin Netanyahu pied pipered Hamas's rise. There's all of these uh, explicit statements that have been reported on where he's talking about that part of Israel's strategy is needing an extremist 
uh, a less sympathetic um, leadership in Palestine that can justify ethnic cleansing and genocide and the like, um, that there was this choice to move troops from the uh, the the wall the Gaza Strip border area to defend some of the people in the settlements in a way that made it uniquely vulnerable at that moment. And that people are kind of putting all of this together and saying, what if this was just the latest, you know, he needed an attack. You know, Netanyahu and his conservative government needed more justification to continue the pogrom of ethnic cleansing against the Palestinians. You can't have them be quiet and peaceful for too long. You, you need something to happen to justify how you're treating them. And so now we have this. Like, what, what do you make of that? And the Palestinians are so stupid that they fell for it and now they've been trapped. Or, or see a legitimate opportunity and are frankly more successful than even Netanyahu perhaps imagined they could be. I don't buy it. I don't buy any of it. Why not? Tell me. Tell me. Because I don't know anything about anything. I'm just trying to parse what's on the internet. Well, so you tell me. Because, because first of all, there's no way in the world that, that, that Israel would have, would have allowed something like this to happen. Palestinians have basically taken over all of southern Israel. All of southern Palestine they took back. There's no way in hell the Israelis knew about it. There's no way in the world that they would have allowed this to happen. And there's no way in the world the Palestinians are, are, are gullible enough to fall for such a stupid trick. It's mm. absurd. You know, people, the Palestinians have their have their hand on the pulse here, the finger on the pulse here all the time. You know what I mean? But again, it falls into this. And, and you know, I said this before. They, people accept this because it makes sense. Palestinians couldn't possibly be smart and capable enough to outsmart Netanyahu and his government. This is a government that is so corrupt, that is so over overconfident. Hubris doesn't even begin to describe how overly confident Israelis were. And they got smacked. They got hit hard because they thought that they were invincible. They thought that they could continue to go and, and, and dance and get high and, and live on other people's land while the other people are being bombed and killed and dying of thirst four kilometers away. And that is not possible. And that's exactly what we've been saying, myself and others, for a long time. You know, I remember my mom always talking about this, you know, <laughs> you know, saying when they come out, it's gonna be terrible. When they come out and decide to, to, to pick up arms, then it's going to be very, very bad. And you know what? It was very bad. But it was only very bad. It was too, it was, it was very bad for two reasons. Number one, because the Palestinians have proven themselves again, not for the first time, but again, to be capable and superior fighters to the Israeli fighters. We saw this in 2014 when Israel had ground troops in the Gaza Strip for the last time. And uh, and it's not number two because Israel is full of humans. Israeli military is too big and cumbersome and effective. Well, tell me about what happened last time in 2014, because, of course, now there is this tense moment geopolitically where Israel has announced its intention to do ground troops. Some uh, Palestinian Arab allies in the region have said, you know, Iran has said, don't do it. You know, we we have interest here in prote protecting the, the rights of, of Palestinians. You have Joe Biden cautioning against it. But you do see there seems to be a great deal of resistance. Um, from the Israeli government to, frankly, lead, following any of the American government's way too late statements urging some caution and restraint here. So it was just reported out yesterday that Anthony Blinken was in a seven and a half hour meeting with is Israeli, the cabinet, um, trying to negotiate something. And all they came out with was the idea that there should be a humanitarian corridor, which doesn't feel new. What is new is Israel bombing the Rafah exit and now this hospital and thwarting humanitarian efforts left, right and center. So that says to me that we might still be in a space where there very might well might be another ground incursion from Israel into Gaza. What would that look like and what can we learn from what happened in 2014? In 2014, that was the last time Israel had uh, ground troops in the Gaza Strip, and they were hit very, very hard by the Palestinian fighters, to a point where they had ran out. They had to take their stuff and get the hell out because they were hit so hard. Very high, you know, high, high ranking officers were killed. The casualty count was way too high for Israelis to stomach. So they took the ground troops and got the hell out. And ever since then, there have not been ground troops entered, no ground troops, Israeli ground troops entered the Gaza Strip. Uh, so Israel knows it, it, the ground troops. That are, don't, don't, don't go into the Gaza Strip and they don't go into southern Lebanon either because they'll be hit very hard by Hezbollah fighters, by Lebanese fighters. So uh, now what they want to do is they want to evacuate the entire northern Gaza Strip, including the city of Gaza. And then they will allow the ground troops to come in. In other words, if the place is emptied 
and we're talking about over a million people, if the place is empty completely and the troops feel safe, they will enter with tanks and just bulldoze and flatten the place because they know very well, and there's no question in my mind, the Palestinian fighters will be there waiting for them. You yeah, know? but we've had any number of testimonials of people saying, I cannot leave because I have a disabled relative or I'm in the hospital or I don't have the means. There are people who have said, I am, um, I, like, I, I, I don't want to go because I don't have any guarantees of rights of return and I'm tired. I've been pushed as far as I can push. And I am concerned that we're going to end up in a world where Israel starts saying anybody who's left must be a combatant. Anybody who's left must be here because they're sta standing to fight and coming in guns a blazing when we already have testimony after testimony of people explaining exactly why these evacuation orders are so difficult to comply with. They're impossible to comply with. They're absolutely impossible to comply with. This is genocide. This is mass murder of civilians without any question. And Israel is not behaving strategically. The, Israel is behaving like a gangster who is humiliated and is taking their revenge out on innocent people. That's what this is. Israel is humiliated publicly and they have to take it out on somebody. So they're smashing everybody and killing as many people as they possibly can just because. But there's no strategy here. And I, I can assure you Israel will not have one soldier, one boot on the ground in the Gaza Strip unless they're able to get rid of everybody, because once again, they are afraid, as, as they should be, of the consequences in terms of, of, of the Palestinian fighters' ability to, to, to engage in battle with them. So it's cruelty. It's, it's savagery. There's no strategy here. There's nothing. There's no way that this can be spinned, you know, as some kind of a military operation. Somebody was saying to me, yes, Netanyahu put together, brought, you know, has now a, a broad coalition government, uh, what they call the National Unity Government. Because he needed some more military expertise to engage in military operation. What military operations? They're murdering civilians by the thousands. This is not a military operation. This is genocide. This is mass savagery, brutality against the people that have never had a military force. I've never had a military force, never had a gun, probably never even saw a gun unless it was an Israeli soldier holding it. Mm -hmm. And these are the people that are now being slaughtered by the thousands as the president of the United States is there now to, to support Israel. This is absolute madness. Oh yeah, wait, wait in on that one. What I mean, what, what, what do you make of that? And do you, like the press has been reporting? Okay, uh, Biden has been moderating his language. He's been urging restraint. Some people, even on the left, are claiming it as, as a victory of some, somewhat as victory of sorts. That our advocacy has caused him to say, okay, at least privately and a little bit publicly, there needs to be some restraint from Netanyahu. What, what, do, what, do, you, what do you make of it? What do I make of it? They're murdering children right, left, and center by the thousands. They talk about burning children. They cared about the, the beheading of children. You know how many children get beheaded when a one-ton bomb is dropped on yeah, their it's home? disgusting. Like you don't see it because nothing's left. So yeah. suddenly Biden has made What the hell is he doing there? They, he's sending the Sixth Fleet. He should send the Sixth Fleet to support the Palestinians, to provide aid, to, to impose a no-fly zone over Gaza. What the hell is he doing there? He's complicit in one of the worst war crimes we have seen in recent history. This is absolutely unbelievable. And this man is going to run for election after this? This makes George Bush look like a saint. So that's wild. I've started slowly to see some people start to say, like, I was going to vote blue no matter who, but I cannot. I just cannot countenance this. Like, I don't care. I cannot bring myself to vote for Biden. And I've been waiting for, frankly, some elected officials who never should have endorsed Biden in the first place, given their pro progressive politics. I'll put that in quotation marks. Um, to back away, specifically my eye has been on Rashida Tlaib as their only Palestinian American member of Congress. She did a pretty strong tweet. I know it's a tweet, but she made a pretty strong statement immediately after the hospital bombing just earlier today. Um, she said, Israel just bombed the Baptist hospital, killing 500 Palestinians, doctors, children, patients, just like that. POTUS, she added him, which they don't usually do. They just allude to him vaguely. Oh, I wish somebody would do something about this. Somebody, somewhere. She says, POTUS, this is what happens when you refuse to facilitate a ceasefire and help de-escalate. Your war and destruction only, uh, uh, your war and destruction approach has opened my eyes and many, um, uh, and many Palestinian Americans and Muslim Americans like me, we will remember where you stood. That was pretty, I mean, that was a departure from the norm in, in terms of tone. What I would really like to see though is saying, I'm going to withhold my vote. I'm going to perhaps cross the aisle and join up with the Republicans who are shutting down the, the government over this, unless you 
insist on a ceasefire and condition our aid on a ceasefire um, and not allowing Israel to get away with bombing humanitarian corridors and things like that. Uh, Are you are you impressed at all by that or is it still just (laughs) you know what we've got we've been accustomed to to accept so little. Yeah, it's true. The problem is the humanitarian corridor. Yeah. The problem is the ceasefire. Hell with the ceasefire. Hell with the ceasefire. Stop sending weapons. Stop sending uh, money. Impose sanctions. Call the ambassador back. Kick the Israeli ambassador out of Washington, D.C. Impose sanctions immediately on the state of Israel and do everything you can to bring down the apartheid regime. This is not going to be solved with a ceasefire. Yeah. Ceasefire is not what we need right now. We need the complete dismantlement of the apartheid state. We need complete uh, ending to the to the to the siege on Gaza. We need the absolute. We need to put to put um, uh, you know, mechanisms in place for the refugees to return to their homes and their land. And we need to end this violence against Palestinians. We need to end this international, you know, conspiracy, if you will, to kill Palestinians. People blame America and the West. So America and the West are, of course, we know, big supporters of Israel. But so is the BRICS, you know, uh, the, this, this mm. new alliance, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Where are they? Mm. Where are they? So they're not supporting, they're not saying anything. Isn't India like Israel's biggest fan? I, I did not yeah. know this before. It is. it is. I was on India TV this morning and I've got another interview tomorrow morning with India TV. And I'm telling you, what are you talking about? The West is not the problem. You're the problem. China is the problem. Where are you? These are country Africa. Israel has over 40 uh, diplomatic missions in Africa. Why in the world would any African country want to have an Israeli mission in their country after everything Israel has done? I'm surprised, I'm surprised by that because I, my understanding was, I remember Googling a map of like which countries recognized Palestine and all of that. And it did seem like most of the global South and everywhere else was on board except for America and its European allies, basically, in non-recognition of Palestine. There's a problem with recognizing Palestine. What's because, that? Because recognizing Palestine is recognizing the Palestinian Authority as a state. The mm. Palestinian Authority supports normalization with Israel. The Palestinian mm. Authority is complicit with Israel. That's the problem. So when a country like Indonesia allows an Israeli team, which has no relations and is traditionally supported Palestinians, allows the, you know, it's, it's debating whether or not to allow an Israeli football, soccer team to come and play in Indonesia in a World Cup, whatever. The past, so there are forces with Indonesia saying, are you out of your minds? You're letting, you're normalizing with Israel. The representative of the Palestinian Authority says, yes, bring them in. Normalization is fine. Hmm. So they are themselves undermining. So undermining the, 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 undermining the Palestinian struggle. So what happens is they're calling for countries to recognize them as a state. Mm-hmm. But that is the wrong recognition because there is no state. It's legitimizing, it's legitimizing the contractors that are helping Israel maintain the apartheid. What needs to be recognized is, and, and what needs to be accepted is the is the Amnesty International report on apartheid. That needs to be adopted by every single country and every single governmental and, and non-governmental organization, because that is the report that states clearly and demonstrates clearly how Israel has been engaged in the crime of apartheid since it was established. And there are recommendations for countries, you know, states and, and, and non-states or NGOs to, to, to deal with this. There are recommendations for sanctions and, and so forth. This is what needs to happen. Recognizing the PA as a state is, is absurd. That's all that people have. And they're saying, oh, we have a Palestinian representative that says we need to do this. But that's the wrong recognition. This is because this is fascinating to me. I love that we kind of started with this idea of what it means for Israel not to exist in its current form. Like I think that was really foundational. Now I'm interested in briefly in the last few minutes we have left of getting some clarity, if there, if we can, about what at least you think it would start to look like to get to that place. Because there has been this critique of Hamas as a political group. Some of that pushback to that critique has been, well, you cannot blame, this is you know, a line many of us on the left have been taking, you cannot blame a population, half of whom isn't able to vote today, and another percentage, significant percentage of which wasn't able to vote in the last election in, what, 2006? Yeah. Is that right? Um, for, for having chosen Hamas any more so, and besides which, it would be immoral to say because you voted for someone you deserve to be killed any more so than any American you know, you, voting for Bush meant that 9-11 should happen. I mean, like, this isn't obviously an absurd uh, argument, even on on its face. 
But what would be helpful? Is Would it be helpful for, for there to be elections or is that going to force the hand of Palestinians in a way that will lead to a result like Hamas that Benjamin Netanyahu can then exploit in the way that, ways that he has? Is it useful, you know, to be calling for the U.S. government to be sanctioning uh, Israel? Of course, the, boy, the BDS movement has gotten you tarred and feathered and put on no higher list by the American government in many states in the American South, as Ab- Abby Martin has personally experienced and has reported extensively on. I mean, what, you know, what, what path do you see um, toward what would meaningfully be liberation, which does seem to be, I'm sorry, inextricably, you can't get around it, a one state, oh, Jesus Christ, they're going to come for me, a one state that is not a Jewish state, that is a secular, secular pluralistic state. Yes, a free democratic Palestine. That's it. That's the recipe. There's no other recipe. That is the recipe. Hamas is not the problem. Hamas has never been the problem. You know, and that's why I don't say Hamas fight, Hamas war. The Palestinian yeah. fighters are fighting. I don't care if they're what the party they belong to. I don't think it matters. But the 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 you're absolutely right. A single free. I mean, it's already a sin one state. Two state solution is 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 is, is, is a Zionist construct. It's not even worth discussing. Hmm. The only thing what needs what needs to happen here in America, particularly, is a is the is a huge paradigm shift. Stop talking about Israel as though there's a possibility for an Israel to exist and peace to take place. Not a possibility. There has to be a dead paradigm shift. Israel is the problem. Israel is the brutality. Israel is the is the is the one that's perpetuating this savage violence against Palestinians. That's it. So you have to pick you have to pick a side. You absolutely have to pick a side. If you believe in justice, in humanity, in democracy, in human rights, then there's one solution, dismantling the apartheid state. And and we've seen this, you know, we saw in South Africa, we saw fascist regimes, we saw dictatorial military dictatorships fall and be replaced by, by, by democracies around the world before. We don't have, you know, I mean, South Africa provides a great roadmap, but there are other examples. And establish a free democratic state on all of historic Palestine. That's it. The country was called Palestine until May 15, 1948. It is Palestine. The fact that somebody else decided to call it something else, I don't think is a good enough reason to call it anything else. Palestine, free, liberated, democratic, one person, one vote is the recipe if you care, for anyone who cares about peace, justice, and wants to see Israelis and Palestinians, you know, alive and safe and free. That's it. The other option is this supremacist, racist, violent creation of Zionism, which is the state of Israel. These are the two options, and it has nothing to do with value. I mean, it has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do with values. If anybody wants to tell me that even if, I don't care if the angel of death lived in Gaza, if that, if that means it's okay to hurt the hair of a single child, I have nothing, to, there's nothing more to talk about. Yeah. It's a question of values. I don't yeah. care if the devil is in the Gaza Strip. That does not justify hurting the hair of a single child, period. And again, you can't argue with this. It's, yeah. either, it's either support, these are your values, or your values are, just, are, are elsewhere. And that's the end of it. That's the end of the story. It's not about Hamas. It's not about anything else. It's only about the brutality of, of, uh, of the Israeli state and the need to dismantle it and replace it with a real democracy. Well, I guess my last question then is just about what your read is on what's happening within Israel right now. I have seen a great deal of pushback. The overwhelming majority of Israelis place the blame for what happened on October 7th on Benjamin Netanyahu for various reasons. Some of them just are mad that his security wasn't up to snuff. Some of them do connect what happened with the oppression of Palestinians and see a direct link there. There have been some parents, family members of people who have been taken, Israelis who were taken hostage, who have shown, I think, the, in the way that you have, an enormous compassion for the preconditions um, of the tra- personal tragedy that they're experiencing, and like the one that you and your family experienced with your knees, and said, you know, liberation of Palestine or equal, equality for Palestinians is very much connected to what is going on right now with my family member. And I, I, I do wonder if you see at all the seeds of an uh, organic movement within Israel now that increasingly might see its fate as linked with the fate and equality of Palestinians and might be supportive of an end to a religious 
the theocratic state. No, I don't. Mm. And I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, the people who are criticizing Netanyahu were criticizing Netanyahu before this. Mm. They're part of the forty-five percent that we saw it in the streets, the hundreds of thousands that were that were demonstrating against Netanyahu. This they come, and the Supreme Court the court reform stuff. Yeah, exactly. So the people that were protesting then are the people that were speaking against him now, and they're right. I mean, it, it, Israel was completely, like I said, collapsed. It was paralyzed. Everything that Israelis expected from their government to do, the government failed. There was no safety. There was no security. There was no intelligence. There was no police. There was no, no military. They were being they were being taken by the enemy forces. They were taken. The country was invaded by actually a very small, relatively speaking group of guerrilla fighters who were represent the enemy and they were taken they were taken the army was nowhere to be seen they were not stopped it took it took days of fighting days and days of fighting before the military gained any kind of, of control over the situation and the israelis are still afraid to go, go out in the streets and the still system is not working and nobody knows what the hell is going on all they think they, they're capable of doing is not bombing gaza because that's that that they know that, that they have control over but Israel, they're terrified, terrified. The entire, everything they believed in collapsed. Everything they believed in collapsed. And Israeli society, we saw over the over the months and, you know, previously, is really, there, there's, no, there's no cohesive society. Israeli society is held by scotch tape, and that scotch tape is ripping apart. And the same thing now we know is true for the Israeli security, the Israeli military, the Israeli intelligence apparatus, it's all held by scotch tape. It's all useless. It fell apart like that as soon as some you know, a small group of fighters came across the Gaza Strip. And so Israelis are terrified. Of course they're terrified. But the call against Netanyahu is not enough to put him in jeopardy politically. He is still the only man that can control this country. He is still the only guy who you can vote for. Now, Israeli politics is all about musical chairs. And one day this general is a minister, one day another general is a minister, one day this guy is a minister. But the prime minister's seat is always going to be Benjamin Netanyahu. Why? Because, number one, he manipulated the system in a way that it's almost practically impossible politically to get rid of him. He's the only one that knows how to build a coalition. In a parliamentary system like Israel, you have to have a coalition. But why is that? Because he seems to be so reviled by, like, everyone. He is reviled. I don't think his mother likes him. But the point <laughs> is, but the point is, he's very good at this. He's a genius at this. He knows the system better than anyone. He's respected more than anyone. And he knows how to sell it. And he's got an, a strong enough political block that supports him right or wrong. He has 55% of Israelis supporting him right or wrong. So he is safe. He's not going anywhere. There's all these theories that because he failed now, he's going to lose, he's going to step down. There's nonsense. Nobody, there's nobody to replace him. Everybody else looks like the like, you know, like like children around him. He's mm-hmm. the only adult in the room. And he created this, and he created, he's been working, you know, he's been in power for more than a decade. And he's been in politics since, you know, God knows when. And he managed to create a system where he really he's the only one that even when he loses the election, he's still able to put together a coalition that puts him back in the prime minister's seat. You know, and so we're not going to see the end of Netanyahu anytime soon. And these are calls, you know, these are, you know, the voices calling in the dark. These are not serious uh, calls for um, for change. And, and quite frankly, there's no change. There's no opposition. There's nobody, even if somebody did take his place, there's nobody. Because they are all in the same, politically and ideologically, they're all in the same place. The only way to get rid of them yeah. is to bring down the apartheid regime like the apartheid state was brought down in South Africa through severe sanctions, through serious boycotts, through kicking Israel out of the Olympics, which would have done, been done a long time ago, kicking Israel out of all sporting events, academic institutions, academic forums, cultural forums, and so on. It's the only way to do it. That's how South Africa was brought down. Not only, but you know, to a large degree. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, how, that's how you bring in a, down an apartheid state, because it's a deeply, deeply racist society and a deeply racist state. But I hope... I have to say, I want to finish with a positive note. There's no question. There is no question. The only reason this we're talking about this, the only purpose for the struggle is to create a better reality, a better future for Palestinians and Israelis. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, Palestinians and Israelis live very close to each other geographically. Very close to each other geographically. There's absolutely no reason in the world why they cannot live 
in a peaceful country, in a peaceful state, you know, normal, healthy uh, state. There's no reason other than the apartheid regime. Yeah. Well, look, I, I, I do feel hopeful because I do think clarity about what it takes, even if you've kind of articulated a path that is very uh, meandering, not meandering, but has been full of obstacles, shall we say. Uh, I do think being clear-eyed about what the stakes are and about what is before us is illuminating and it will help us not get kind of sheep herded into interim solutions that maintain the status quo of apartheid for Palestinians. I think that's really important. I am also encouraged by the possibility of what it would mean to use the current political context of the United States and it being an election year where Joe Biden is struggling mightily to make our protest efforts and vote withholding efforts and the like hurt more and perhaps have a greater effect because he needs the public behind him to survive an election more than he ever has. And I am hopeful that we're going to see increased radicalization among the progressives in Congress who are willing to do more than just tweet. I'm hopeful. And I'm very heartened by all of the protests that have happened uh, around the world, including um, the Jewish group that was being knocked around by the police in front of the White House yesterday as they were protesting in solidarity with Palestine. It is very heartening that a year ago or so, Katie Halper was fired from the new show that I co-host as a correspondent. They say it had nothing to do with content, but it was after she did a speech about the rights of Palestinians that they chose to terminate their engagement with her. And that that was over her calling Israel an apartheid state. Well, a year ago, that was too saucy for TV. And now I don't hear a left-leaning person open their mouths to start this conversation without starting with the precondition that, of course, Israel is an apartheid state and, of course, Palestinians are under occupation. And as small as that might be, that feels like real progress. And so I'm so glad that you were able to join us today, Miko. You've been really wonderful. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you on the internet and find your books and any any other um, work that you've put out? Sure. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm on you know all social media platforms. I'm on you know, Instagram and Twitter mostly. Um, so, and uh, mikopella.com is the place to find my articles, my videos. There's Patreon as well. I'm on Patreon. I have a Patreon account as well. So. Patreon.com slash Micopella. There's tons of content there. I've been posting a lot since since October the 7th and um, getting a lot of views, a lot of shares, as I'm sure many others are. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say something the other side. I'll say something about my book that it's a, it's a great primer. It's the, the, I think the quality of this book is it's a primer. So when people are confused, people are on the fence, people are kind of struggling with the issue, this book takes them through my journey from being a very staunch, proud Zionist to you know where I am today, through this journey of an Israeli into Palestine. And it's very personal. So I know I hear from a lot of people that it's a great primer for uh, if anybody wants to know about this issue in a, in a deeper and more meaningful way. But uh, thank you so much. It's, it's, it's a great talk to you. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. It, the pleasure really is mine. Thank you so much, Miko. Thank you to all the listeners. As always, take care of yourself. Keep the faith and remember that if you want additional bad faith content every week, including Monday's premium episode with Omar Badar, getting into some of these issues, uh, different areas of, of what's been going on in Israel, Palestine, uh, you can subscribe at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast for $5 a month and get the whole catalog of stuff. But I'm so glad that this episode is uh, going out uh, for free because this stuff really is important. Thanks again. Keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast. That's patreon.com slash bad faith podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.